Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, I know people will probably be coming and going and getting uh, food, but I think since we have a very rich menu uh, and a short time that we might as well get started. Uh, I'm Catherine Marshall. Uh, welcome, delighted to see you here. Uh, we're going to be speaking uh, today about a, a vital issue uh, which is essentially about family welfare as we frame it, uh, but also demography, uh, particularly focused on the Sahel region, uh, which is an area that, that we're uh, working in. So welcome first to the Berkeley Center, uh, uh, celebrating, I think, its 11th year now at Georgetown. Uh, you're also here with the World Faiths Development Dialogue, which is an NGO that was born in the World Bank. And we have uh, scheduled or we have planned this event because WFDD had its board meeting yesterday. So we're particularly honored to have uh, some of our board members here. Uh, Rabbi David Saperstein and Tim Lancaster uh, are both um, our key board people and uh, part of the, the effort to bridge the gulfs between the worlds of development and the worlds of religion, uh, where there is often neglect or uh, preconceptions, uh, but where there is an enormous potential for improving the quality of development work. I'm not going to speak much longer, uh, except to say the plan of, of, uh, that we have for, for today. First, uh, John May, uh, who is a former World Bank uh, staff member, who's also been in the Population Reference Bureau, but who is now at Georgetown University, uh, but one of the world's leading uh, demographers, uh, will give us a, a bit of an introduction, basically answering the question why this issue uh, is so important, uh, and uh, essentially some of, the, some of the key points. Uh, we're then going to hear from Rachel Robinson, who is at American University and who is doing research particularly on this area. Uh, their bios are on the web, uh, so I'm not going to give uh, detailed by, uh, bio information. Uh, then uh, Lauren um, Herzog and Wilma Mui, who are the core staff people of the World Faiths Development Dialogue, which sits here, uh, will speak about the work that we have done and are doing in Senegal. Uh, to And there's a lot of information on the table about it. To engage religious leaders in what is a nine country uh, partnership, the Ouagadougou Partnership, to address uh, the issues of family planning in one of the poorest regions of the world, which also is the champion, the champions in terms of the large uh, numbers of children uh, that women are having and the critical issues that that represents for those countries. So they will talk about that. They have also just been last week uh, in Niger, uh, and uh, which is the, in, in many respects, the country people are most concerned about on these issues, is sort of the epitome of the challenges of religion, uh, security, uh, family welfare, uh, health, uh, population, human development. So they will talk a little bit about, they're, they're to give you, in a sense, uh, a, uh, an aperitif, but also to tempt you. Uh, and uh, Lauren Van Enk from the um, Institute of Reproductive Health here at Georgetown will talk a little, set it a little bit in the context of the work that that institute does. And finally, last but not least, Tim Lancaster uh, will uh, tell us what he thinks we should be doing next or will give some comments uh, about, uh, about how he sees it. He um, was saying yesterday that he's had three careers, 
Uh, one of them was in the World Bank, both as a, um, as a staff member, but also on the board of executive directors. He also ran the British Development Agency, and he has a very distinguished uh, career in a number of academic institutions. So he brings some, uh, some very special um, attributes. So with that, I will turn it over to John. We, we'd like this to be informal, but we are taping the, this for people who can't be here, and therefore we have to ask everyone to speak from the podium. So that's, uh, that's the element of formality. John. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, African demography, why it's so important, and uh, what we could do about it. Uh, first of all, today, uh, population of Sub-Saharan Africa is about 1 billion persons. And that's projected to be more than 2 billion by 2050. That's 2.2 billion. And then will be perhaps 4 billion at the end of the century. So the 21st century will be dominated by, to a large extent, but what happens or what doesn't happen in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the problem is that uh, this will cause uh, and have consequences not only for Africa, but also for the rest of the world. When the world population will have about 35% of the total population of the world being from Africa, it's going to be a totally different paradigm than the one we have now, where we have about 18% of the world population coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, next, the key issue for African countries is to get jobs. And they need three things. They need jobs, they need jobs, they need jobs. According to the IMF, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa needs about 18 million new jobs every year. To give a comparison with India, India needs about 12 million new jobs every year. Africa needs about 1.5 million new jobs every month. So how to get those jobs, especially as the world economy is changing, and you will hear from Davos, from Davos where we are entering into the fourth industrial revolution, may, might be less needs for those jobs. Now, the silver lining in all this is that Asia, East Asia, has experienced uh, demographic dividends. And that's uh, an economic surplus, which is caused by the decrease in fertility and the change in the age structure when you have relatively more active people. And provided these people have a job, they have themselves less dependence, you can really boost the economy. So now, could Africa replicate this uh, situation of East Asia? That's a big policy question mark. And I just devoted uh, an edited volume to this, Africa's population in search of a demographic dividend, Springer 2017. Now, the key issue to get uh, demographic dividends is to change the structure. And to do that, you need a very rapid and significant fertility decline. And that's not happening as yet in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a very rapid decline in infant and child mortality, which is a good news, and I hope it will keep going. But the fertility decline is very slow. And sometimes fertility countries are experiencing fertility stalls where the fertility would be stuck at some level, let's say four and a half children for 10, 15, 20 years or so. So to conclude, I would like to say that the leadership in Africa has to realize that a fertility decline, a rapid one and a significant one is needed if they want to someday capture a demographic dividends. If you look at all the emerging market economies, all these countries have achieved what we call their contraceptive revolution, where they have about 75% of couple using uh, modern methods of contraception. In Africa, we are at about one third of that. It's about 26% of CPR, the contraceptive prevalence rate. So there is still a very long way to go. 
But I am afraid, and that's my work for the time being, that the leadership doesn't realize that there is a linkage between a rapid and significant fertility decline. Now, African fertility is at about five children per woman. The world fertility is about 2.5, so Africa is about twice above. And they need to have this rapid fertility decline. And I'm afraid that the link you know, is not yet there in the mind of the leadership in Africa. So with that conclusion, I would like to say this uh, seminar today is very important because we need to have all types of allies if we want to really accelerate the fertility transition in Africa. It's not just a supply of contraceptive methods. It's also the creation of uh, greater demand for smaller family size. And it's a lot of social change, uh, gender equity, female education, you name it. And I think the work you are doing is extremely important. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much to Catherine and the Berkeley Center for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. In fact, a um, former student of mine worked here for a while. Crystal, is she still here? OK. No, she's now on the stage. OK. Um, but she really brought to my attention all of the wonderful things that you do. So by way of background, where I'm coming from, I'm an academic. I'm a sociologist and a demographer like John. And I'm still shamelessly plugging my book that also came out next, uh, last year, which is about the relationship between family planning and HIV interventions, uh, focusing on Senegal and Niger in Nigeria as well as Malawi. So I'll speak from that perspective as well as some other research. I have two main points that I'll make today from my experience studying both family planning and HIV, but also sexuality education and politicized homophobia in sub-Saharan Africa and those two countries. Uh, so first, I would argue that religious objections to social problem programs have as much or even more to do with concerns about the locus of institutional authority in society as they do with the beliefs of any given religion. So keep that in mind as an idea to play with. And then second, and relatedly, efforts to build relationships with religious leaders and broader messaging about social programs should address these concerns head on about the locus of authority rather than try to co-opt leaders or people into changing their beliefs. So I'll address these points with four examples. Um, the first is positive contributions by religious leaders to family planning and HIV prevention in Senegal. The second is challenges with religious leaders related to family planning in Nigeria. The third is the role of religion in sexuality education in Nigeria. And the fourth is the role of religion in politicized homophobia in Senegal. So first, family planning and HIV in Senegal. Top line, in short, religious leaders were important in a positive way to the government's efforts to provide family planning and carry out HIV prevention. What made this possible? The intertwined relationship between religion and politics that has developed in Senegal through many centuries, uh, and that sort of was something that could be capitalized upon um, both explicitly and in less direct ways. So in essence, it was relatively easy for programmers, and I use this term to mean everyone from people within governments, within civil society, even those working for development organizations, to reach out to religious leaders to discuss family planning in the 1980s. The barriers were, let's say, shorter than in other, or less high than in other countries. In the book, I talk about how this experience with family planning then laid the groundwork for a very similar set of conversations to occur around HIV starting in the 1990s. But there was an important Islamic NGO by the name of Jamra, run by, run by someone with political and religious connections, which quickly got involved in HIV programming and helped serve as a very important liaison. So there was a key civil society actor that had both religious and political ties that helped uh, make this connection possible. They'll come back later on in my fourth example. <laughs> so that was example one. Example two, family planning in Nigeria. In short, religious leaders obstructed government and donor efforts to provide family planning. 
Why? Because they interpreted those efforts as taking away their authority. This relates particularly to what happened, this is somewhat historical. So Nigeria passed a population policy in 1988 that came to be interpreted as a four-child policy. So again, China has its one-child policy. Nigeria's population policy was interpreted as a four-child policy. Both Christian and Muslim leaders and religious groups strongly objected to this policy. Christians felt that the policy was unfair to Christians because it allowed a Muslim man who could have up to four wives to have 16 children, but a Christian man could only have four. And as I suspect a number of you are familiar with the politics of population in Nigeria, constant battles between who is more, Christians versus Muslims, different states, these types of things. Muslim leaders, although they sort of won the numbers game in the population policy, also felt that the policy took away their power because it, t it distributed the power about decisions of children to the state and to women, not them. And so we're similarly upset, though for different reasons. So that's example two. The third example, religion and sexuality education in Nigeria. In short, religious leaders have had varying effects on the prioritization and implementation of sexuality education in Nigeria. Why? Because context matters. It's not just about religion. So in 2001, Nigeria's federal government approved a national sexuality education curriculum, which then meant that each state was supposed to adopt it and implement it. So Kano, in the very north of the country, in the Sahel, uh, was actually did a very good job with implementing sexuality education, despite what you would expect in terms of being in a more conservative state, in large part because a local NGO run by a Muslim woman with great, very high levels of local legitimacy uh, worked to support the, the curriculum. And in particular, she had gained legitimacy for her NGO both by being a devout Muslim and by engaging in a variety of vocational programs, other sorts of programming that had nothing to do with sex or anything politically sensitive. Niger State in central Nigeria, still the north of Nigeria, um, but despite being 80% Muslim with Sharia law practice in places, uh, it was not that that led to a relative failure of implementation of sexuality education. It was just bureaucratic bottlenecks and disorganization. So straight up problems, they couldn't decide who was supposed to be the signatory on the, the account that was going to give them the money to implement the programming, and things fell apart from there. Then in Lagos, in the more cosmopolitan, more Christian south of the country, it was parents who were the source of the objection. They framed their objection to sexuality education frequently in religious terms. But I would argue they were deeply concerned about giving up control over who taught children about sexuality education. So again, concerns about control and the locus of institutional control within society, less about religion. I will say as a side note, um, in an effort to reach compromise across the states in Nigeria, they were allowed to modify the curriculum to suit their needs. And this did lead to a great watering down of the curriculum beyond what its initial proponents had hoped. Uh, so fourth example, politicized homophobia in Senegal. In short, HIV interventions made LGBT populations, particularly gay men, much more visible. Political leaders have used homophobia, however, as a means to gain popular support, thus inhibiting HIV prevention. The fascinating thing is that the same religious NGO that was so important to linking the government and civil society and citizens more broadly for HIV, JAMRA, has become a major obstacle because of the political ambitions of its leaders and affiliates. So their effort to gain political control couched in religious terms has been, um, really has negative health ramifications for LGBT populations. And they are contributing to negative discourse about homosexuality. So that's the fourth example. So I'll conclude just with a few points. The objections of religious leaders to family planning, HIV prevention, and sexuality education have more to do with them protecting their own positions of power than with scriptures or even practices of their individual faiths. A proposition. 
Those interested in working with religious leaders must actually work with them, as opposed to seeing them as a mouthpiece to the masses that can be co-opted. This has long been, I felt very uncomfortable with how the average family planning program treats religious leaders. Oh, yes, yes, we need to talk to the religious leaders. But they're seen mainly as a, as a tool that can benefit the program as opposed to a source of genuine dialogue. And then third, and this is not coming from my own research, but from that of others, religious leaders do still need a lot of targeted education about the benefits of family planning, sexuality education, um, the importance of HIV prevention, and these various areas of reproductive health um, and health more broadly. Thank you. We're going to move next to Lauren and Wilma, but I wanted to give just a little background on the Ouagadougou Partnership, which not everyone here might be familiar with. Uh, it is a, uh, an alliance, a program, in the nine Francophone West African countries uh, that is related to what's called FP2020, which is the global effort to revitalize uh, family planning. Uh, Rachel was actually speaking about some of the work in the 90s. There was a, a lot of focus on family planning issues, particularly around the Cairo uh, and then the Beijing meeting. But at least our perception is that it went way down in the priority list for a number of years. Uh, and it has been only recently that there's been a revitalization, revitalization of, the, of the interest in family planning. And of course, a particular interest in this part of the world uh, where, the, where, as I said, there are some of the highest population growth rates um, in the world. So the Ouagadougou Partnership involves a number of foundations and governments, including US aid. Uh, the French uh, uh, government is involved, Canadian now, the Dutch. In other words, there are a number of bilateral agencies. UNFPA, the UN Family Planning Agency, is involved, um, as is the World Bank. Um, I don't think the African Development Bank actually is directly involved. Uh, but they have now um, a very sort of McKinsey-like um, focus on strategic plans, targets, quantified um, outcomes for each of the countries. And they meet once a year. So the meeting that I was just at was in Conakry uh, in December, which was their annual meeting, where they have, from the beginning, had uh, governments very prominently, but also civil society. They have a civil society group. They have women's groups. Um, they have um, unions. They have had, basically, a constituency approach, where each one of them comes to these meetings. What they have not had traditionally is religious leader engagement, but that is what is changing. Uh, and for the past two years, they have had from each country one, and this year two religious actors. Uh, we have um, been part of this now for the past four years, and Lauren and Wilma will be sort of talking about some of the high points. Uh, but the Hewlett Foundation, Gates and Hewlett are the big um, foundation players uh, in this effort. Um, but the Hewlett Foundation has supported what we call a strategic approach to engaging religious leaders starting in Senegal. And by a strategic approach, we would contrast that with, I think, what Rachel was alluding to, which is you find an imam or you find a pastor who is interested in these issues. You run a few imam training programs. Uh, you might even hint at what they would include in their sermons. Uh, but it does not involve any kind of a broad look at the religious landscape and power structures uh, history uh, within the country. And that is what we have tried to bring in Senegal. Uh, because it has been linked to a mapping review where we have basically uh, studied and written reports about the way in which the religious landscape um, works in Senegal. So the effort to engage the religious leaders through, um, through a whole set of institutions is the core of the Senegal project. Um, and I will sort of give a, a spoiler on this by saying that we view it as somewhat miraculous uh, that this has 
succeeded as well as it has. Of course, it depends a lot on the people who are involved uh, on the Senegal side and here. Uh, but it is also um, a lot of luck of contacts uh, and the um, capacity to deal with it. But uh, to me, family planning is one of the most fascinating issues in development because it goes all the way from very, very individual decisions which are influenced by many factors, of which religion is one, but your uh, health, your mother-in-law, um, uh, your money, your finances, all of those play a role. But it goes from there at each stage all the way to the United Nations, where clearly family planning is one of the tensest issues when you look at the um, issues of religion uh, and how it's, how it's reflected there. So at every stage. So in Senegal, just as an example, uh, the um, teaching about reproductive health, not to speak of youth, which I think Lauren and Wilma re will refer to, the government is extremely hesitant because they fear the backlash from religious leaders. Uh, and the Ouagadougou partnership very rarely deals with another issue across these countries, which is radicalization. Uh, and certainly in Senegal, one of the fears is that there are religious leaders who are prominent who equate family planning uh, with a Western plot to limit the size of, of Muslim populations. So you're dealing with the sort of hidden issues around radicalization, uh, some of the issues around migration, uh, at the same time that you're dealing with the high maternal mortality uh, and the high uh, child mortality still, which are linked to these issues around family welfare and family planning. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for giving some of that general context of the Ouagadougou partnership in Senegal. So I think a lot of our work starts with what Rachel was talking about um, with institutional versus, versus religious authority um, and taking religious leaders as partners rather than just slotting them into the family planning plan, whatever that looks like. Which brings us to the beginning of our work in 2014. So we have been doing this for about four years now. Um, the very beginning of this story is Senegal's family planning uh, action plan or strategy for 2012 to 2016, which of course mentions the religious leaders um, and, and has these ideas of religious champions. So kind of hand-picking religious leaders who can speak prominently in the media um, and, and really champion family planning in Senegal. Um, however, the, the Ministry of Health wasn't really sure where to go with this. Um, and, and the religious leaders don't really want to be fit into this pre-existing plan. Um, I think in Senegal, they're pretty aware of, of the dynamics. Um, they see that you know the politicians a lot of the time will come to them when they're looking for um, support during political campaigns. They don't want to just be slotted in. They said, you know, this, this family planning strategy has already been created. We would have wanted to be consulted at the beginning so that we could help determine what our role would be rather than just playing this government role. Um, they very much see it as instrumentalization. They're very, very aware of those dynamics. Um, so that's, that's the beginning of the story. Um, and at that time, and even to some extent today, um, misconceptions still exist around religion and family planning in Senegal, but luckily to a lesser extent. Um, so as Catherine was saying, the idea that family planning is this Western plot to reduce the number of Muslims. Um, also just all sorts of um, rumors around um, different family planning methods and how they could actually be um, used for sterilization, things like that. Um, so there were a lot that, that revolved around religion and family planning. There was a key role that religious leaders could play here. Um, so at the very beginning, um, Catherine had made contact with Sheikh Saliou Mbake. Um, she had known him for years, and he happens to be um, a descendant of Sheikh Amadou Bamba, who is very, very prominent in Senegal as the founder of Mauritism. Um, so he became the, the core 
um, the key person on the ground in Senegal, and helped uh, gather this group of religious leaders um, for a meeting, um, a diverse group of religious leaders um, cutting across the Sufi orders of Senegal, some of the main Islamic associations, um, the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, all to come together and start discussing what some of the issues were around maternal and child mortality, um, the fact that a lot of maternal and um, infant deaths are avoidable, and the roles that religious leaders can play, what religious teachings say. And so from there, this has slowly formed into a core group of religious leaders um, who are now very active and very enthusiastic about supporting this mission. Um, they were able to get support from all the different religious communities by slowly um, doing what they call visite de courtoisie, or courtesy visits. So going and, and meeting with the high level religious leadership of each community to discuss what the approach was, what the mission was, um, so that each community was very much aware of the approach that they were taking and the work that they would be doing. And then each community designated a representative to take part in the group. So I think that's been a really unique component and a, a, a definitely a strength of the approach. Um, to have this high level, the, the mandate coming from the highest levels, um, and to have the, the representation of all the different religious communities. And I think in Senegal, you always hear about interreligious relations, um, very positive. But a lot of that has been interreligious dialogue. There's been very little interfaith action. Um, so that's also um, been a learning experience for the group, but they see this being an interfaith effort as very important, um, that all the religious leaders are coming together and that this actually increases the, the, the legitimacy of the group. Um, so the, the group has several core components um, to their activities. Wilma will address some of these more in depth. Um, one is reaching out to women. Um, and, and reaching out to women at the community level. And they're doing this through a network of religious groups in Senegal, specifically through the Sufi orders that are called dairas. Um, another approach has been using targeted messaging in the media. Uh, when we first started this work, the religious leaders said, we're not quite ready to go on the radio. People aren't ready to hear us talk about this. That has evolved. They, they felt in their communities that this was that family planning was becoming less of a taboo, so they started going on the radio on call-in shows. Um, they were getting pretty positive feedback from people in their communities, um, and it's just in the last six months or so that they finally said, "We think that the Senegalese population is ready to see us on TV." Um, so, so you can see that they're they're feeling things out in their communities and they're sensing the change um, and around the discourse on family planning. Um, the next thing is there is an M&E effort that Wilma will talk about some of some of the insights that we're getting from the ground and how things are evolving there, um, attitudes and behaviors on family planning. Um, and then, as Catherine mentioned, there's the regional um, dynamic within the Ouagadougou partnership. One of the components of this work has been for this group of religious leaders now called CRSD, um, Cadre des Religieux pour la Santé et le Développement to visit other countries in the Ouagadougou partnership to discuss approaches, challenges, um, exchange on best practices. Senegal has been seeing some success with this. Their contraceptive prevalence rate has nearly doubled in the past few years. Um, we can't say that all of that is due to religious engagement, but I think that the religious engagement is changing the discourse, is making this less of a taboo and, and starting to kind of move the ball on family planning. So they have visited Mauritania, uh, Guinea, and Niger. I think Guinea, we, we really saw a lot of will to make things happen. I remember we were in a meeting, I believe, with the maybe Islamic Association of Guinea, and um, the, the Senegalese religious leaders were talking about how many deaths are avoidable um, if you space out births. And we just remember seeing some of the imams in the room, their faces, and they said, we didn't know any of this. And so I think we saw a lot of buy-in from um, Guinea's Ministry of Health, from some of the civil society organiza organizations, and also from the religious communities to move things forward. Um, so starting this year, we'll be working with the Senegalese religious leaders to help pilot some activities in Guinea to see if 
those same discussions and the same approach that worked in Senegal can maybe help to start move things, moving things in Guinea. Um, and as Catherine said, we were just in Niger earlier this month with the same approach. Um, so to have those conversations between, um, it, we were with a group of eight Senegalese religious leaders from CRSD and also a representative of Senegal's Ministry of Health. Um, so you can see that there, there is a growing uh, relationship between Senegal's Ministry of Health, which now says that they realized how important it was to go to the religious leaders, so that's why they went to them from the beginning. So the story is, is changing a little bit on that side, um, but I think that shows how enthusiastic Senegal's ministry is and that there is this growing partnership there. Um, but so we met with several different uh, government entities in Niger, um, civil society organizations, religious institutions, both uh, Muslim and Christian, to start having some of these discussions. Uh, and I think people were largely positive because CRSD members all promote family planning within religious teachings, within what's accepted within religious teachings. Um, and so people seem to be very on board, especially with the idea of birth spacing within the Muslim communities um, for, for health reasons. That being said, one of the things we found interesting was that nearly every organization, government entity that we met with said, of course, we're engaging with the religious leaders. We had this meeting. Um, so in my mind, that, that comes to one of two things. Either people seem to be largely overstating the level of religious engagement that there is, or religious factors don't play that much of a role, which I don't think is the case. When we were at Pathfinder um, in Niger, they gave us uh, the results of a study that they had recently done. And in that study, it said, 68.7% of girls, and this was married girls, agreed with the statement that I cannot use family planning because of my religion. <coughs> so I think we can't say that religion doesn't play a role here. Um, so I think there's some denial in terms of how much religious engagement is going on. Um, that being said, I think one of the strengths of CRSD's approach has been to have a diverse group of religious leaders engaged, and I don't yet see that in Niger. I see one, one key player who is trying to organize the family planning movement and serve as the religious um, kind of contact on the ground. And I think to have success and, and move things forward there, there needs to be broader religious engagement um, and greater representation of the various religious communities. On that note, I'm going to turn it over to Wilma. All right. So I'm going to take us back to Senegal and talk a little bit about our work there. So Lauren mentioned that we work with women's groups. Um, so that really started off as a very small movement where we had this amazing midwife um, in Senegal who bought into this religious um, engagement. And so it started off simply with her and uh, members of CRSD going to a daira and then speaking about the religious aspect of family planning, and then she would go into the technical aspect. So having the dual approach of the religious leaders speaking about um, family planning and what is allowed within religious teachings, it followed up by the technical presentation was very successful. So in our first year, she did 20 of these trainings of these uh, workshops, and we reached a little under 1,000 people. Um, in year two, she decided that she was one person. She runs a clinic. She couldn't do all of these workshops. So she trained different trainers in the regions to do the same thing. And in year two, we reached over 14,000 people. And in year three, over 16,000. So as you can see, our approach has definitely grown. And another aspect that we noted was in the beginning, we, we had men attend these workshops as well. Um, it was targeted at women, but men were more than welcome to come. Um, so in our first year, we started off with about 13% of participants being men. Um, and then in our second year, that grew to 24%. And in our third year, it grew to 33%. So a third of our participants ended up being men. Um, and as you can see, men are often times decision makers in the household, so engaging men and having them hear the religious argument as well as the technical side was very important. 
Um, and then, as Lauren mentioned, we also have an M&E program. And so we had a baseline two years ago. We did a midline last year, and our consultants on the ground are about to launch um, an end line slash baseline for the next phase of our project. We're rolling it to one to um, save funds. Uh, so the first, in our baseline, we went to six different regions and we used mixed methods. Um, so we conducted over 400 surveys of um, married men and women, and we conduct conducted focus groups as well. Um, and we also did in interviews with religious leaders. And from that, we found some really interesting data. Um, so of those people that we surveyed, about 98% were Muslim, and about 25% of those participants were uh, in polygamous marriages. And we wanted to know where they received their information on religion and family planning. And um, we found that 82% of participants said that they listened to religious television shows. And 51% listened to religious radio programs. So as Lauren mentioned, our religious leaders decided about six months ago that they are ready for television. and. Um, as you can see from these numbers, they can reach a very large audience. Um, we did have some challenges with our baseline. Um, in our program design, we wanted a random sample. Um, in reality, it was not so random. So we found that um, in our baseline survey that 64% of participants said that they, or as a couple, use family planning methods. That is over about three times the um, numbers from other surveys. And so as we dug in deeper, we found that our consultants and our surveyors had reached out to health centers um, in certain regions, and that potentially skewed our numbers. Um, so we found a lot of interesting information from our focus groups um, and our interviews. And examining those, we found a lot of misconceptions about family planning. We heard a lot of the family planning is a Western plot. We heard um, rumors and misconceptions about condom use. Um, we heard a lot of uh, People talk about the perceived side effects of family planning that in reality, when we are studying them, they don't exist. Um, so that really built into uh, CRSD's work. So they took that information and they directly addressed some of those misconceptions. Um, in certain areas, there's, um, for example, in uh, one region, there was a very low contraceptive prevalence rate. And in that region, we found a lot of people were talking about the misconceptions of, um, the, of the family planning methods and how they caused infertility. So um, CRSD was able to take that information and to address that specifically. Um, and yeah, so our, <laughs> our consultants are on the ground um, starting at the end of this month, so we will hopefully have some information to compare to our baseline and to see how our program has impacted um, the family planning perceptions and attitudes, and hopefully we'll have a publication on that soon. Can you mention quickly? Oh, sure. Um, so, when CRSD is um, doing their work, they very much target married men and women. And so they, as religious leaders, are not able to directly address unmarried youth and sexuality. Um, they are very hesitant to um, talk about it. And so everything that they do is within the married context. And I would just quickly add that, that one of the challenges for them as religious leaders is that there's a lot of pressure from um, different family planning actors in Senegal uh, to address the youth question. As religious leaders, they don't, they don't feel like they can really address it that much, um, that it would undermine their legitimacy to address it very much. What they say is they can have an implicit approach where if unmarried youth come to the events, they're happy to have them there because they see it as preparing them to be successful as um, future husbands, wives, mothers, and fathers. 
Uh, but, but I think this shows that there's still great misunderstanding of how to work with religious leaders. Um, and I think their efforts need to be seen as complementary to other family planning efforts rather than thinking that religious leaders can be all things for all people. All right, that was a great presentation and builds uh, on a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. So my name is Lauren Van Enk, and I'm with the Institute for Reproductive Health. This is a research institute that's part of Georgetown University, but we're located off campus over uh, in DuPont Circle. Um, so we make it our mission to address global challenges related to family planning um, and unintended pregnancy and just expanding access to women who are seeking to use family planning. And we really want to make sure that every woman has the child that she wants when she wants it. But unfortunately, uh, as many of you probably know, every day approximately 800 women die from pregnancy-related complications, 99% of them in the develop developing world. And mortality rates are also higher for infants born to very young mothers and infants born too quickly after the birth of the previous child. Studies have shown that allowing women and couples to delay their first birth and space subsequent pregnancies three to five years apart has dramatic effects on the health of the children and the mother, thereby improving the health of the family and the well-being of the community. One could argue that it could even affect population concerns at a macro level, like food security, pandemics, and even the stability of nations. And I emphasize those health issues because those are the very things that are compelling when working with religious communities. Um, many women, in fact, want to avoid pregnancy, but are not using a modern method of family planning to do so. And collectively, we are striving to help find ways to kind of bridge this disconnect, you know, a, a desire to delay pregnancy, but not using a method. Um, and we are finding that in countries where there have been a lot of large gains, that progress is stalling as of recent. And it's much less about geographic access to family planning and much more about attitudinal resistance. So as part of the demographic and health surveys, which are some of the most robust data we have on population health, women who say they want to delay their next pregnancy but are not using a method are asked why. And three key reasons emerge. The first one is a misunderstanding of pregnancy risk. So this might be a woman who has just given birth and is breastfeeding and doesn't feel she is at risk of pregnancy. Or it could be a woman who just doesn't understand her body and the way her menstrual cycle works to know which days during her cycle she's fertile. The second reason is cultural, religious, or social barriers to modern method use. And finally, as Lauren and Wilma just described, it is a fear of side effects. So this is both the real side effects that family planning methods do in fact have, but it also is so much about the myths and misconceptions and the rumors that happen around those methods. So tackling barriers related to attitudinal resistance can be difficult, it's non-linear, and it's slow. And it requires an approach that's focused on local norms and beliefs. All communities are guided by social norms and gender norms, even our own. But some of these norms can have harmful effects, favoring uh, values like aggression or unilateral decision making, especially among men, which can result in conflict and poor health outcomes. And um, as most of you probably know, since you're here, gender equality measures across the Sahel are some of the lowest in the world. One of our projects at IRH is called the Passages Project, and it aims to address these social norms at scale and build evidence around normative interventions for family planning. So to change a social norm, it's essential to change individual perceptions about what others believe and do. But no one might dare to question those shared rules for fear of negative sanctions. So where does that leave us? Um, this is where social influencers, like, for example, religious leaders, could play a role. You've heard maybe of this concept of disruptive solutions. Well, religious leaders can be part of that positive disruption in a community. 
And many see and truthfully recognize that religion can perpetuate harmful social norms. It can also be part of the solution. Faith communities build individual and collective values like human dignity, forgiveness, respect for people as image bearers of God, and these values affect relationships from the most intimate to the most distant. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, we're working with Tear Fund, which is an international FBO, uh, to promote gender equality and positive masculinities within faith communities. Through workshops and structured small group discussions, the intervention draws out spiritual uh, reflections and scriptural reflections on gender equality, gender-based violence, and family planning. This approach is currently being done with Christian communities, but it's being adapted for the Islamic context as well. So at IRH, we've seen across our decades of work engaging FBOs and religious leaders um, that when they see and understand the benefits of family planning, they do become more supportive. Um, indeed, some have relatively conservative views related to family planning, but working with religious leaders where they are, working with them as partners in ways that are consistent with the community's needs and their values, um, really can open up new avenues for further dialogue. For example, one thing at IRH that we do is we often open that conversation with the discussion around fertility awareness methods. These are natural, modern, effective methods of family planning. And this opens a door where a door may not have been opened before. And if you can open that door and begin to build the trust, you can build things and continue the conversation from there. Um, World Vision speaks eloquently about how they did this in northeastern Kenya with an Islamic um, uh, majorly Islamic population. So while some of the approaches in the family planning community certainly exacerbate the divide between that community and faith communities, we know that from our experience, common ground areas do exist and progress is possible. So I'm just really encouraged by your willingness to both look at the challenges around religion, but also think aspirationally about how they play a part of the solution. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. I'm not a West Africa expert or family planning expert, but um, I'm interested in this, this topic very much today. Um, Professor May, of course, rightly um, told us about the, the importance of both the supply side and the demand side and the necessity of getting both right. Um, I'll just start with a little story about my um, one direct experience with family planning projects, that was in India in the early 1970s. I was the junior World Bank staff member on the very first World Bank family planning project, uh, which was in India. And uh, the 1960s and 70s was the period of what one call, might call high modernism in development studies and development policy. And high modernism is the idea that the world can be changed through science and technology and through direct planning. And it, it, this was epitomized in the Soviet Union, but was also uh, epitomized by Robert McNamara and by other planners um, on this side of the world. It's this idea that if you, if you understood technology, if you could throw money at things, you could achieve the change. And this was... Um, this was the, the basis of the World Bank's approach to family planning in India. So we had, a, we had a distinguished medical man on the team. We had a demographer, Paul Domain. We had um, um, a couple of economists. I was the junior economist. And what did we do? We, uh, we, I collected the numbers. I went around six districts of Uttar Pradesh, uh, very poor districts. Um, largely Muslim districts, and we worked out, um, we knew, we, we, uh, we discovered what the fertility rate was, we, we, uh, we did our, our sums and we, we asked ourselves how many condoms would have to be supplied, um, how many tubectomies, how many vasectomies, and we did simulations and we, uh, we worked it all out, what, what would be the cost effectiveness, 
And um, we uh, recommended certain amounts of money that would go to each of these uh, districts. Um, but we barely asked ourselves whether and how the, uh, the men and women in these areas would actually respond and whether they would respond. Um, there was no engagement whatever with civil society. Uh, we talked to governments in Lucknow and uh, they were fairly resistant, but um, they said, okay, um, throw some money and resources and, and do it. Um, but we had no engagement with the religious communities. Um, the World Bank in those days, and including myself, I have to say we regarded religion and religious organizations as um, either things to be ignored or despised. And we had no uh, interest in really understanding what was going on in society. There were no anthropologists in the World Bank. There were no sociologists. So this was a classic supply-side approach. Technically quite competent, no doubt. Um, and there was a, an element of marketing. I think there was some money thrown in it. Um, there was no television in UP at that time, but uh, there was going to be money for newspapers, Urdu, and Hindi newspapers, um, which would advertise the uh, benefits of, uh, of family planning. Um, and no surprise, um, it wasn't a success. <laughs> um, indeed, it was a bit of a disaster, because within four years, um, such was the disappointment um, in the bank, but the the bank didn't really do anything about it, but the real disappointment was in the federal government in New Delhi. And this was a period when Mrs. Gandhi was kind of uh, becoming a bit autocratic, and her eldest son, Sanjay Gandhi, was the serious autocrat. And he, um, um, he decided that um, he would um, offer small amounts of money to males if they would agree to vasectomies. And uh, this was interpreted um, because of the way it was, it was uh, um, encouraged and as a policy um, as forced sterilization. And so the family planning uh, program in, in India was, was knocked back a number of years. Uh, I lost touch with exactly what happened, but it, it, it really went into reverse in the late in the late 70s, and this was attributable, I think. Um, I mean, you couldn't do this in a democratic society. I mean, India, for all it, all its uh, political difficulties, was basically democratic. This was not China, um, so um, there was this reversal, and. Um, it, the lessons took many years to, uh, for, the, for the, the, these to be learned. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, moving on 40 years, it is extraordinarily encouraging to, to, to know that here, um, but I think in, in, in aid, aid agencies generally, and it's certainly the case in, at DFID, which I headed in the 90s, um, anthropology and an understanding of institutions and society became integral to uh, um, development. Um, no doubt it came, it came rather slowly. But um, I think what we've heard today is, a, is incredibly encouraging, the fact that there's a, an attempt to really um, understand and work with the demand side, if I might put it that, that way. It's slightly technocratic way of putting it, but I'm an economist. You have to forgive me for that. Um, you know, there was an economist, uh, um, Albert Hirschman, who I admired, um, but uh, in the academy in Britain and in America at that time, he was regarded uh, as a bit of an oddball, an incredibly impressive German-American economist um, who wrote a book called, I think it was called The Strategy of Development, but we didn't, uh, we sort of read it. Loyalty is the other one, yeah. We, we read it, um, but we sort of put it on one side because the models of Rosenstein, Rodin, and all these other, Characters, the Soviet economists seem much easier to understand, and um, it's only now 
in the la last decade or so that Hirschman's insights, his, his view that you had to understand institutions and people if uh, development was, was going to work. Um, he, he wasn't popular in the World Bank. He did some work for the World Bank, and they told him to go away. So coming back to Senegal, uh, I think um, what our young colleagues are achieving there is quite remarkable. Uh, I think they've had a bit of luck because um, they're working in a country where there is this uh, extremely favorable um, political institutional um, situation. But you've used, used that situation and, and worked with the, these various confrères, what are they called? Conferees. Um, and you've found some people there who, to work with. And the way you've uh, worked with medical and religious leaders and with education, educating the religious leaders or getting somebody else to uh, interpret the Quran and uh, educating the women's groups um, has achieved extraordinary results. Um, and I think the, uh, the challenge now is to see whether that can be replicated in, in other countries. Uh, you're, you're working in Niger, which appears to be a much more difficult situation. Not only is the, uh, is the population challenge with seven fertility of, is it? Seven by seven. seven. I mean, it's, it's pretty bad news, really. Um, but the institutions aren't as favorable. And um, I think the lesson of what you've, you're doing in Senegal is you have to dig deep and understand the institutions and work with people who are going to be um, helpful and uh, persuade people. Uh, and avoid what uh, Sanjay Gandhi did, what, what, what the World Bank did back in those, those early days, and really focus on the demand side. Of course, there are supply side issues too, um, getting the methods out there. Um, I mean, the World Bank made a, a big mistake on the supply side. They put a lot of emphasis on tubectomies. And I'm not a medical person, but I think if you're going to emphasize tubectomies, there have to be, has to be, women have to have access to medical. Um, and if you have to travel 50 miles on, on, on an ox cart, you've had a tubectomy and you've got a, uh, and you've got infection, it's bad news. And uh, again, you know, misunderstanding, you, you have to, you know, the people were right. The women didn't want tubectomies because they fear, they had fear. And you had these, these men, we were all men, um, so sort of putting that on one side, you know, some, it'll be okay. So uh, I think it's, uh, I won't go on congratulating you because, um, but the fact is you're, you're doing a great job. And uh, if, you, if you can move on to other countries or um, work with other practitioners, um, combining analysis, but good practice and uh, developer program in other countries, I think this would be incredibly useful for Africa and the world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim, and thank you to this really remarkable group of, of people. At one point, by the way, we thought we were going to have a woman which is a women-only panel, but happily we uh, we uh, achieved much more diversity. Um, a couple of, um, we're going to open it up for a discussion. Uh, how much time do we have now? 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Uh, so get ready for, and do we have a mic or is that what we're going to do? Um, just a couple of comments. Um, one of them, um, when we first started working in Senegal, uh, we asked about women religious leaders, because when you're dealing with family planning, um, you need to engage women, obviously. And the first level answer was, no, there are no women religious leaders, and there are no women's religious networks. Uh, but we were able, we discovered basically that that's not true. Um, there were quite remarkable informal women's networks, which is, uh, what has been developed. Um, the uh, midwife that both Lauren and Wilma referred to is called Rokaya uh, Tiam, and we have an, a remarkable interview with her on our website. She actually started as a communist. Um, she experienced domestic violence herself. Uh, she 
overcame many obstacles. So her life story is fascinating. Uh, but the way in which she engages with the religious um, actors um, is quite fascinating. The other comment I would make is that if we had had a choice in Senegal of the issue to start engaging with religious leaders, family planning would not have been the issue. Um, it was the um, fact of the Ouagadougou partnership in the interest of the Hewlett Foundation specifically that took us to family planning. But our hope and expectation was that the focus on family welfare, in other words, the, the whole welfare of the family, of which family planning is a part, would take us into other issues. Uh, and in many ways, the most obvious one has been um, child marriage, which is a major issue in this region. And it was one that the religious leader group was initially quite uncomfortable with. Um, they, their basic view was that child marriage is probably a pretty good thing. Um, we also had some members of the group who thought that female genital mutilation was also a pretty good thing. So the discussions that have taken place have um, really changed a lot of those uh, discussions and we think the views. Uh, the other factor, which I think, uh, Tim, in the World Bank, we knew this, and, and John, is that, that there is this element of competition that among countries that sometimes does play a role. And it's been interesting to see that in the Ouagadougou partnership, where they are very aggressive about, you know, they, this year, the, the countries, I think it was Burkina Faso that did the, the highest um, numbers of, uh, of um, increase in family planning. But, but it has an, a surprising effect, the, um, the competition among countries. More positively, and something that, that we've worked on is, is taking um, e examples of what's happened elsewhere, these exchange visits. In fact, the first visit was to Morocco. Uh, and that had a, a tremendous effect on the religious leader group, because Morocco, in many ways, Ways was way ahead of the um, Sahel region in, in terms of their family planning, but also in the ways in which the religious actors were engaged uh, on, these, on these issues. So that, that was a real eye-opener for them. And one of the reports there has uh, some graphs, the, the, the blue report at the end of, of different countries, uh, Muslim countries, and the sort of looking at these graphs and seeing how poorly Senegal was doing uh, clearly was a wake-up call to the to the to them, and this the same is now true um, as Senegal looks at, at at other countries. So we have 20 minutes. So who'd like to start? Any of the panel want to? Oh yes. Okay. Great. Um, uh, perhaps you're aware that in China they had the one-child policy per family for years, and finally it was abandoned. Their population is, is perhaps the greatest in the world, but it hasn't been growing as fiercely as other countries, and they figure there's more room uh, to increase the population at this point. Uh, India, of course, has gained on them tremendously, past one billion people. Uh, I wondered, uh, is there any way to approach the people of, say, Senegal or any African nation and ask about a two-child policy or some more limitation uh, so that uh, the population won't get out of control and beyond the means of the nation to support the populace as far as food, jobs, whatever it might be. I think, John, you might be the best place to answer that. There was a big ruckus this um, summer, by the way, when ECOWAS, the West African Regional Organization, came out with a comment which basically suggested that there should be a limit, basically, of three child per family. And we all know that talking about population control is a is a no no. We don't talk about that anymore. John, do you want to? Yeah, uh, Catherine. I think that since uh, Cairo, uh, September nineteen ninety four, the world has changed. We are getting away from targets, from goals, from uh, quantitative goals, and we are moving into reproductive health, reproductive rights. So the world has totally changed. We cannot come back. And to say, no, you should have only three children or you should have two children, uh, it's, not going, it's not going to go down very well. And I think, in a sense, it's uh, better that way because we should uh, predicate our efforts 
on the individual freedoms, on the decision of the couples to have as many children as they want. Also, another thing I would like to say, if you uh, bring things into a global perspective, uh, the high fertility countries now, it's the, it's the end of a process. We are talking about 12, 13% of the world population uh, where there, is, there are more than four children per woman. And so that has also uh, caused, I believe, mm -hmm the fact that the population issue as such has been kind of pushed uh, to the background and is not, has not received uh, enough attention in the last decades. So we have to appreciate that the world has changed. We have uh, the post-Cairo era, uh, and we have to work uh, this way um, now. If, you, if we do the supply side, and that's the effort of the Family Planning 2020, you remember uh, Melinda Gates, she had the London Summit in 2012, and they were uh, going to help 120,000 women to have access to modern contraception, 69 priority countries, two-thirds of them in Africa. And when you look at what happened since, and there was another summit in London, I think, in 2017, uh, on uh, World Population Day, uh, July 11, uh, things are going slow, slow. The supply side is, uh, is very important, is necessary, but we have an increase in contraceptive prevalence rate in the um, high fertility countries, which is uh, in Africa, it's about uh, a bit more than half a percentage point per year. We would need 1.5 percentage point per year to really move faster. So we have to work, and I think that's what Tim was saying, we have to work more on the demand side. And uh, so I plug into what uh, Rachel said, that we have to think about the, the power structure and the, the power game. Uh, and it's only not only the powers in the institution, but I think also the power between men and women, uh, which is another uh, huge dimension. So I think the, the time has come to, to move away from the, the top-down approach, the, the target approach, and you mentioned uh, the India disaster of the emergency, uh, 75, 77, if I remember well. And all that's now, it's history has given a bad name sometimes to family planning, like if you read the book by Matthew Connolly, Fatal Misconception, I think. Uh, but now we, with this work here in Senegal, we are moving to a, a new world, uh, which is kind of promising. And I think there are some avenues that we should explore even better. It's the empowerment of women. Uh, if we can have African women to take their destiny in their own hands, and to really be to have the power, I think we are going to see changes. And uh, probably uh, the African region will not have 4 billion people at the end of the century, could have only 3.2 or 3, which, which would be probably better for the environment, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think that's where we have to work. That's the battle line uh, of tomorrow. Thank you. Tim, and then Lauren. Can I, I just uh, ask, put a question to John? Um, it's what struck me that the demographic dividend argument um, can be a bit confusing to policymakers. Um, it strikes me that the demo <laughs> there's very rarely a, a dividend um, for human flourishing for individuals. There might be a, a dividend for the state because a larger population for a country um, enables a country to develop military power or whatever, but it's, I think it's quite hard to see how a larger population can actually improve uh, living standards. And I think the uh, ex espousal of this view, um, particularly in India in, in, in the last 10 years, has actually resulted in people taking family planning less seriously. And I was a bit concerned when you, you mentioned, well, there could be a transition to a demographic dividend in Africa, and I, I couldn't really understand that. Perhaps you could comment. The demographic dividend is an ex-post theory which was based on an analysis of what happened in East Asia. 
And so uh, David Bloom, David Canning, and others uh, designed this uh, concept of a demographic bonus or demographic dividend, which is actually based on a change in the age structure. It's not just the number of people, it's the age structure which is changing. So you have relatively more active people, less young dependents. And before the old dependents would start to kick in, you have a window of opportunity, which is about 40 to 50 years. Now, uh, whether that can be replicated to Africa is a big question. I I think it's a bit of a pie in the sky for the time being, um, especially uh, for different reasons. One, the fertility decline is very slow. Uh, to cite uh, late uh, Jack Caldwell from Australian National University, there is a very slow erosion of high fertility levels, so it's going slow, slow, like a lot of things in Africa. And um, also the, the requirements for labor are totally different. Uh, that what happened in East uh, Asia, we, we outsourced, we, we made China the factory of the world. Is Ethiopia going the factory of the world of tomorrow? I'm not con totally convinced. So I think the demographic dividend is, uh, I think it has been oversold to African leadership, but it's, uh, it's the flavor of the month. So what can I say? Everybody is taken with the uh, demographic dividend. And it might not happen, or it might it might happen, but in a very uh, in a number of decades, not right now, in most African countries. Pardon? To come back to the question about can these countries put into place some sort of policy that that limits children, and how would that be received? I think one of the issues in Senegal and many of the other Sahel countries is that people were equating the term family planning with birth limitation. And so I think people were resistant to any sort of family planning because they saw it as birth limitation. I think moving the conversation um, to clarify what family planning means and what family planning can be um, in terms of things like birth spacing, so spacing out children um, for health reasons, has actually increased the use of family planning. I think um, to have any sort of limitation policy in place would be detrimental. And I think in that context, there would actually be a backslide in the number of users. Um, if we look at Senegal, um, the, the Muslim religious leaders in Senegal agree for to birth spacing for health reasons. So space out your children, put a couple years between the, between the pregnancies. Um, birth limitation is not something that they accept. So I think if there was any sort of limitation policy, there would be uh, a lot of backlash from, from the religious communities. One comment on this is that the, for, for a long time, you had the arguments that population control was what was important for the survival of the world. Uh, and that really created backlashes and has gone out of style. We are hearing more questions like that and comments like that with the um, climate change debates and the environmental issues that people are again worried about the carrying capacity of the world and, and so forth. So uh, we find, I, I cringe now when I hear population control uh, because uh, we know that it's, first of all, it's against human rights, it's um, denigrating the, the rights of the individual, uh, but it also generates very negative reactions. So finding ways to have that discussion as climate change becomes a more prominent issue is important. Lado. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all the your input. Um, which is very, very interesting in terms of, um, uh, I mean, what I'm, I want to touch on is actually local ideological debate about these issues of whether you are pro-natalist or anti-natalist and all the policy dimension of it. Uh, my impression is that actually at the local level, obviously reaching out to religious leader is a good way to, 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 to approach it. But I guess another main I mean, stakeholder down there these days, I mean, you also find them in, I mean, in intellectual circles where 
people are more and more distrustful of interventionist approaches, especially when uh, John was talking about this linkage between uh, population decline and probably development, uh, 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 especially when it comes from outside. Um, uh, and if you put it in historical perspective, uh, um, people having experiencing, I mean, having experienced policies like, I mean, structural adjustment and, and their failures um, very much distrustful of some of these, you know, blueprint approaches to what works and what doesn't work. And, and the idea that what has worked as, elsewhere will work for Africa, uh, uh, even in intellectual circles, it is very much debated today. And I don't know how that is factored in when there's dialogue between Western intellectuals or policymakers and African intellectuals and policymakers beyond, I mean, beside religious leaders. That's what that was. That would be my question, probably to, mainly to John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't think we are talking about population decline. Whatever we do, population is going to double and it's going to triple in Africa. What we are talking about is the change in the age structure, which is the fundamental uh, issue. And that's the fundamental uh, goal if we want to, in principle, get a demographic dividends, there must be a change in the age structure, the active adult versus the their young dependents. I was just going to add on that last important point. I think from my own work, this is what really speaks to the deep involvement of local organizations in all conversations. Um, it has been striking to me in terms of family planning, HIV, sexuality education in a number of sub-Saharan African contexts. Local organizations led by charismatic people, funded by external donors, almost always, but led by uh, people who have great legitimacy in the context in which they're working are crucial uh, for buy-in, for making connections, um, but also for channeling resources in productive in productive ways. I mean, so I've one of the things I've sort of began saying is like, you know, if you if you care about this issue, you have to support local organizations, and that donors don't actually like doing that. It's not very sustainable, right, to give money to organizations so that they can keep the lights on and do things like that. But I actually think it um, can contribute to many broader broader goals. Um, just two other comments on this very interesting conversation. Um, one about the demographic dividend, of course, after fertility declines, governments have to invest, and they have to invest in human capital. And the good thing about that is, I think. In some regards, it, it is an easy sell. Um, I think many African leaders like the idea of a more educated population that can be, be more productive, but it does take a lot of resources. And you have to have people saving. And so thinking about setting that up. I share John's skepticism about what the demographic dividend, if that can be reproduced in Africa. But those are things that have to happen. And then the final comment about population control, two thirds of African countries have population policies designed to limit population growth. Um, none of them have targets. Actually, Nigeria's old one is one of the ones that has a sort of more explicit target. But it turns out that um, these programs, even in China, are not hugely effective. So demographers are debating the extent to which the one child policy can actually uh, be attributed to, or China's fertility decline can be attributed to that policy. So things that work, um, the example from MATLAB in Bangladesh showed that you know door-to-door -door community health workers providing contraception as well as oral rehydration salts to you know save children's lives as well as basic basic health information that has had a lasting impact decades later. The regions that were part of that intervention have lower lower fertility. Now coming out of FP 2020, um, real efforts at providing family planning in the postpartum period. So capturing women immediately after delivery and giving them a family planning method then to make sure that they're essentially not lost to follow up. Um, our techniques, again, for I think for what um, Lauren really spoke to, making sure at least before you, the women who want to be not having children soon have the techniques to do it before even trying to convince somebody else who did want to be having children to change their ideals. Yeah, 
Well, in the discussions that we've been part of, the, the area that in a sense is the most difficult is the uh, issue of youth. And of course, we're dealing with populations that are w by large majorities very young. And so the fertility issues really are often, inv they involve directly child marriage or they involve um, uh, pregnancy among unmarried unmarried mothers. Now, just as an, an illustration of, of that issue, we don't know the numbers, but we're hearing a lot about infanticide in Senegal, which is not part of the tradition. Uh, it, but um, women in prison, it's it, uh, are often there because of infanticide, which to me speaks to the level of desperation uh, of young people who don't have access to family planning but who are sexually active. Uh, so this issue of dealing with youth, I don't know of many religious traditions that are comfortable about talking about sexuality outside of marriage. It's uh, it's. But uh, I know, for example, Salyu Mbake was at this meeting uh, in, in Conakry uh, in December, was very uncomfortable with the way that the Ouagadougou Partnership and the Gates Foundation uh, and so forth were basically dealing with the youth issue, which was very much, a, you know, we have a right to contraception, uh, a lot of um, very, you know, modern discourse, you could call it. Um, and uh, clearly, th there's a need for a dialogue between the religious leaders and the um, and the religious communities and and the young people. And having this be a subject of of tension is not um, is not conducive to reaching solutions to things that include um, child marriage um, and uh, the this this an awful issue of of, of infanticide. Yes. I was wondering, Rachel, whether it's going to be more difficult to replicate um, what uh, Lauren and Wilma are doing in Christian and animist countries. I'm thinking that maybe in the in the Sahel, where it's predominantly Muslim, more of a, a unified ideology, um, etc. Whether it's easier, where, whereas in a place like Zambia. You've got numerous Christian um, communities, animism. How you actually get into that, it seems to me, might be, might be more difficult. So I think that's an extraordinarily important question. And I think uh, two things. First of all, it just totally depends. So early on in the 2000s, when I um, was first looking at HIV in Africa, I was in Namibia. And, you know, there it was the Catholic bishops who would, they had come out and said, yes, condoms are okay. I mean, so they had just totally gone against their broader, their broader faith community. So anything is possible is the first thing. But what I do think is that, um, which I think you allude to, uh, religious divisions can be particularly challenging. So homogeneity, Senegal's homogeneity is an asset. Um, but homogeneity comes in different forms. And I think Nigeria's diversity, although it can be an asset, is one of the things that greatly complicates these matters. And so uh, sometimes it's not a question of which particular faith or which particular group, but how the power structures are laid out across religious, ethnic, regional differences. Oh, we're th this is the last comment because we have to okay, liberate I'll, I'll you. I'll make it quick. Just to say that IRH is actually working in a majority Christian context of Uganda doing something very similar. And I just want to recommend or just emphasize this idea of having both the medical um, lens as well as the religious lens. So we're right now we're working with the Christian Health Associations in Uganda, which provide a large proportion of health services to the people. So having that legitimacy of being that medical lens and also having the service availability, but working with all of the religious leaders in that context. So you have a facility where the, the services are active, but then you also say, okay, who are the influential churches here? Is it a Seventh-day Adventist? Is it Protestant? Is it Anglican? Is it is it a new evangelical mega church that does doesn't have really any denominational connections. And you invite those people in for the dialogue and to be able to have that back and forth about what is family planning, what are the myths and misconceptions, and that's worked incredibly well for us. Good. Well, we've come to the end of our time, so let me 
thank all of you um, warmly for being here for your wonderful questions and wonderful presentations. And let's, let's continue the dialogue.